Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to get started here. Um, I'm told Congressman Peters is supposed to come and make remarks, which will be wonderful. I'm told he has a vote. So what we're going to do is sort of pause whenever he's able to come and join us, and then we'll resume. Um, I'm Jesse Stolark. I'm a policy associate with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And thank you again for joining us here this afternoon and for all of you joining us online. Can you not hear me? That's better? Good. Thank you, Maureen. So we have a very exciting program um, about biogas and the tremendous opportunities in terms of waste management. Um, I want to thank, before we begin, our wonderful partners in, in planning this briefing, the American Biogas Council. ABC represents over 200 companies from around the world and across the biogas and anaerobic digestion supply chain. And then if you weren't already aware of my organization, EESI, we were founded over 30 years ago by a bipartisan congressional caucus. And today we now function as independent nonprofit and we provide nonpartisan fact-based information on a range of energy and environmental issues to inform Congress and stakeholders. So before we start today, I'll just tee it up a little bit uh, on biogas. Um, in the United States, if you weren't aware, um, for those of you who are not with ABC today, our waste management issues continue to grow. The U.S. alone already produces more than 70 million tons of organic waste per year. This includes both edible and non-edible food waste, as well as manure, agricultural wastes, and biosolids. And while we absolutely must address the fact that we needlessly waste 40% of our edible food in this country, we still have a tremendous waste management situation on our hands. Despite these challenges, there is a tremendous opportunity in utilizing biogas and anaerobic digestion systems to create positive outcomes from waste management and also create economic activity and opportunity in so doing. So we have a great panel for you here today. Um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, which is Patrick Surface. Patrick Surface has led the American Biogas Council since early 2010 when he helped 22 companies come together to form the only trade association representing the entire biogas industry in the United States. ABC now represents over 200 organizations and has a network of more than 11,000 stakeholders in the biogas industry. Patrick has over 15 years experience growing other clean energy industries like solar, hydrogen, and fuel cells through the company that he manages that manages ABC Technology Transition Corporation. So I'll turn it over to Patrick. Great, thank you, Jesse, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. A big thanks to uh, to EESI for helping us to to organize uh, this briefing for all of you, and also to Congressman Peters for helping to sponsor this and and make sure that we have a space to be able to talk to you about biogas today. Um, that's our favorite topic. I think you'll find that um, our members who are up here who are going to talk to you about specific projects in the biogas industry, we're hoping, we're hoping that that'll be really interesting to you. I'm going to talk to you very broadly about the biogas industry, but very shortly. Um, and then really I want them to have the spotlight because their individual projects are really going to show you how the biogas industry works and the benefits that you uh, get from it. So um, the biogas industry is the trade association for, uh, for the biogas industry, and the Biogas Council is, and uh, we represent the entire biogas industry. There are a few other groups out there that are regionally focused or focused on one part of the biogas industry. Um, we cover the whole industry, and so if you need information about biogas and all the different things that we do, please do come to us as a resource. Here's your look about at what a biogas system is if you're not familiar with it. Basically what we're doing is we're taking in organic material and we're digesting it and then we're creating a gas, liquid, and solid stream coming out of that. And each one of those streams can be turned into different products. So what is organic material? Organic material generally, um, we're thinking of manure. So manure from cows, um, poultry, and pigs. Wastewater biosolids, those are the solids that you pull out of everything that you flush down the toilet and send down the sink. And you'll be hearing about what happens when you flush the toilet here and send stuff down your sink here um, with that stuff because it does get turned into biogas, which I think is pretty awesome. And then food waste, and that includes uh, food scraps that may come from your home or from a restaurant, but it also includes industrial food waste as well and then all kinds of other organics. Um, woody waste can sometimes be included, um, and there are some ways to do that. That um, We use woody waste at Clark's facility. He'll talk about that. Generally, though, across the industry, we're talking about non-woody waste. All that organic material goes into a closed tank. And in that closed tank, just like in a cow's stomach, and like our stomachs, we have microbes in there that are eating up the organic material. When a cow's stomach and, and in an anaerobic digester, the specific microbes that are in there eat up the organic material and they burp out methane. 
And that methane is captured in the closed tank. So that methane rises to the top of a tank like this. Sometimes they're below ground, sometimes they're above ground, but they rises up to the top and we capture all of that. And that's your energy. So all of the gas then comes over this way and it can be used for electricity. You can turn your gas into heat. You can turn it into vehicle fuel. You can put it into the pipeline for any of those uses. You always process it a little bit, the raw biogas coming up, you process it. And then when you process it to pipeline quality, um, like our natural gas pipelines, it is exactly the same as fossil natural gas in terms of its molecular structure, but it's been renewably produced. So you can use it exactly the same way that you can natural gas, but this is renewable natural gas. On digestate, the digestate is your liquid and solid stream. And this is really important because I think a lot of folks see the biogas industry as an energy um, industry and energy interest. And it is true that energy and renewable energy is really important to us and is a big part of what we do. But it's not all that we do. And part of what we would like you to be able to take away from today is those other things besides energy that our industry offers and it brings. Because it's those value added things that I think are being overlooked and help you to understand, well, if we're asking for this policy um, in Congress to help grow the biogas industry or help solve some issue, well, let's look at how the cost of that policy compares to all the different value that's coming out. All the nutrients that are in, all of the organic material that came in, those nutrients after they go through the digester, those nutrients are still there. Your nitrogens, your phosphorus, and your potassium are all still there. And so we're recycling those nutrients. But those nutrients are now in a better state than they were before because instead of putting a banana peel on the ground or in a field, or instead of spreading raw manure on the field or raw sewage on the field, now that organic material has been digested and it's fully broken down and in a state that the plants are ready to absorb those nutrients. And so that helps the number of things. First of all, crops are going to go faster and right away, but also those nutrients aren't going to run off into the watershed as much because they're getting absorbed by the soil right away. And the material's a lot safer because you've usually killed all the pathogens that might have been in the manure initially, and now you can apply the digestate on crops that are growing instead of, or soon to grow, instead of raw manure, which you definitely don't want to do that with. So the digestate is a safer and more valuable material that you have with, and by the way, we've probably knocked down most of the way or all the way the odor associated with those materials. And so if you're a neighbor next to a farm and your farmer has been really successful with their business uh, and their herd size is growing, while well, their animals are growing, the amount of manure that they're producing is growing, the odor related to that manure could be growing unless you can contain that manure and manage it in a closed um, biogas system. So those are some of the things that our industry um, offers here. And you know, a lot of the policies that I'll talk about at the end um, are energy related, but um, I want you to make sure that you understand the nutrient recycling value and the digestate value, the soil amendment value that we have, and then all the material that we're really managing. So this is your current economics, economic slide, and this is the last thing that I'm going to leave you with here before I turn it over to our friends. So we currently have 2,000 operational biogas systems in the country. And all those dots on the map there are where those operational systems are. The blue ones are at wastewater treatment facilities. The red ones are on farms. The yellow ones are at landfills. And there are a few green ones on there, and those are our food waste only systems. Food waste can be added to all of them, but we have standalone food waste systems too, so we don't double count, we, send, we count those separately. So 2,000 operational systems around the country. Uh, but we see the potential for over um, 13,000 new systems that could be developed, and that's a lot. Europe has a really mature biogas industry, and they've got 10,000 systems. We can do more than what's being developed in Europe. We can create the economic development that comes along with that. So what does that look like economically? 13, 000, 13 to 14,000 new systems is at least $40 billion in new capital investment. It's over 300,000 new construction jobs. It's over 20-some thousand permanent operational jobs. And these are jobs that don't just come in once to install the systems. These are the operational jobs that are every year after year after year after these systems are operating. These are good, high-paying, um, blue-collar jobs to help operate our digesters. Oh, and by the way, we protect the air, we protect the water, and we protect the soil along the way. So I mean, you wouldn't be surprised to hear all those great things from us. We believe that biogas can, can do a lot. But I want you to hear directly about how this works with um, actual projects. And uh, we'll talk to you about policy in just a minute. Thank you.
thanks, Patrick, for that great introduction. So next up, we have Brian Seavers. Brian owns and manages his 2,300-acre family farm, which has been in operation since the mid-1800s. The Seavers family farm raises 2,400 head of cattle and has a renewable energy facility with a combined heat and power anaerobic digester, which is a one-megawatt system, which is fueled by the methane on the farm and was created in 2013. Today, the digesters process over 50,000 gallons of cattle manure per day. <laughs> Just think about that. And, uh, and other off-site co-feeds in the complete mix system. The electricity that's generated 24 hours per day, seven days per week, is sold to the local service provider. He is also currently serving as chair of the Iowa Economic Development Authority's Biomass Conversion Committee and has served two times in the Iowa legislature. I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Actually, if you noticed, uh, when uh, Patrick started talking about how biogas systems work, I had to turn around to make sure I was doing it the right way. So I was glad to see that, uh, that I was. So thank you for that slide to make sure. Um, I'm going to actually pull up my presentation on my screen as well, because I have a number of uh, comments that I want to be able to share that are going to add to, hopefully, the value of, of my presentation. So let, give me just a second to do that. Okay, <clears throat> so Brian Seavers, uh, farmer, uh, beef producer, uh, producer of um, water quality benefits, soil health benefits, and oh, by the way, uh, we produce biogas too. Uh, and that biogas is used to generate electricity on our farm. But what I'm wanting to do today is talk to you a little bit about uh, anaerobic digestion from a farmer's perspective in Iowa what our facility does and, and, and what type of production we have in our uh, AD facility, uh, why these types of on-farm systems are important to not only agriculture, but to the United States in general. And, uh, and I'd like to also uh, ask, uh, uh, you know, how can, how can we help you or others possibly achieve the beneficial results from, uh, from anaerobic digestion systems like ours? AgriRenew uh, is a company that my wife, and, and I do want to also uh, make note that my wife, uh, Lisa, is here today. She's joined us, uh, came from Iowa, and took a few days off from, uh, from uh, the busy life of trying to run a farm and a feedlot and a, and a renewable energy facility. So thank you for, for joining on, me on this trip. And uh, we've been married for 36 years, and she's now been my business partner on this project for about, I don't know, 10 years. And let me say, being a, a business partner and married to your business partner is challenging, but I, I love every single day of it and uh, builds character. <laughs> Recycling farm nutrients, agriculture processing waste for energy generation, water quality, and soil health. That's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, if I go and talk a little bit about AgriRenew and who we are, we're on a farm uh, located near the little town of Stockton, Iowa. That's in extreme eastern Iowa. Uh, as I indicated, we re recycle farm nutrients such as beef cattle manure, biomass, uh, and other carbon-based substrates for uh, energy generation and odor control. Uh, AgriRenew is a joint venture that uh, Seavers Family Farms and Seavers Renewable Energy, uh, two LLCs that my wife and I created, along with Davidson Renewable Energy, which is a 20% a, a owner, a partner in uh, AgriRenew. Uh, that is owned by uh, Dr. Bill Davidson and his wife, Judy. Dr. Davidson is a gastroenterologist in the, in the Davenport, Iowa area. Uh, AgriRenew uh, owns all the structures needed for the processing of our uh, uh, waste streams. Uh, those include two anaerobic digesters, effluent storage structures, uh, separated solid storage structures, biomass storage structures, separators, dosing units, pumps, etc. And we're located on a farm in northwest uh, portion of Scott County, Iowa, in extreme eastern Iowa near the Mississippi River. We uh, created Seavers Family Farms uh, back in 2010 to start this uh, path. Uh, we actually, um, <clears throat> I went to a conference in Madison, Wisconsin, an anaerobic digester conference, and and as was alluded to, I had served a couple terms in the Iowa legislature, one on the House side, one on the Senate side. After I got out of the legislature in 2004, we started looking at ways to expand our farming operation and specifically our beef cattle operation. Uh, it took four to five years before I really started to kind of settle on the idea or concept of that closed loop system where we could take the resources that we're blessed with on our farm and maximize the value of those uh, natural resources uh, right there uh, in our facilities. 
So again, Seavers Family Farms uh, owns the, the cattle barns, the commodity storage structures, and other uh, nutrient handling equipment. So when we have a meeting with uh, our junior executives, uh, this is a lot of times what it looks like. Uh, love our family. In fact, I had a picture of uh, our new, uh, well, she's now one-year-old granddaughter, so she would join our junior executive team very shortly here. Uh, but this is really what it's all about. It's a family operation. Um, it's it's uh, built essentially by my wife and I. We were very fortunate when we actually went through the construction process. We served as our own general contractors. Our son, who had uh, graduated with a law degree from Drake University uh, and had gotten a degree in uh, uh, Ag and Biosystems Engineering from Iowa State served as our uh, 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 manager of our project. And uh, so it was really, really awesome to be able to have your own son managing the construction of this digester. He's now moved on to uh, Greener Pastures. He now actually serves as a, a patent attorney for John Deere uh, in East Moline, which is just uh, about 25 or 30 minutes away from where our farm is located. But he still lives close by with his family and uh, four grandchildren of ours, so we're very blessed to have that involvement. But it's certainly a family operation, and, and we're very proud of that. This is a, an aerial view of the facility after we had constructed our first two cattle barns. Uh, the two cattle barns, are, uh, as I indicated earlier, were 1,200 head facilities. Um, <clears throat> Seavers Family Farms owns the facilities. Another company that we created, uh, Glenora Feed Yard, rents the facilities from Seavers Family Farms and feeds cattle uh, in these facilities. Manure is now contained and then is utilized in our on-farm digester. Just another shot of the cattle barns. And I'm going to move through quickly here. Here's the, an interior shot of our cattle barns where our cattle are housed. And then on to the digester. These are the two uh, complete mix uh, anaerobic digesters we completed construction on in September of 2013. Uh, they are both 970,000 gallon complete mix tanks. We also have a uh, CHP, uh, combined heat and power engine, that we generate electricity from the biogas that's produced from the facilities. Uh, the important thing I wanted to mention at this point is that um, we were able to uh, take assistance through uh, some, just some awesome uh, USDA programs through REAP, uh, through EQIP, and now also utilize BCAP to use that incentive to leverage the investment that was necessary to build our facility. The anaerobic digester facility total capex was around seven and a half million dollars. The cattle barns and other structures totaled up to about four to four and a half million dollars. So a total of twelve million dollars was leveraged by that five hundred thousand dollar REAP grant we received. That's one of the points I want to drive home. Programs that are beneficial to agriculture, to rural communities, are able to leverage additional private equity investment dollars. This is an example of that. Again, just another uh, shot of our anaerobic digester tanks. And finally, one more from uh, a grain leg that we had that I decided to climb up and take a shot off. Uh, one morning, I, I quickly climbed back down because it was windy. <laughs> this is our uh, uh, Caterpillar 3516 gen set. It's a one megawatt gen set. We uh, uh, run that 24-7, of course, uh, generate uh, you know, roughly 23 and a half megawatts a day of electricity. We sell that to our local power company, Alliant Energy. Our rate is uh, six, currently 6.4 cents per kilowatt hour. That rate will drop to 4.8 cents per kilowatt hour in October for two more years. And then in, in 2020, in October of 2020, our power purchase agreement will expire and Lord knows what the rate will be at that point, but it's probably gonna be in that two and a half to three cent range, I would guess. That's gonna prevent, present a tremendous challenge for us at that point, financially. <clears throat> Uh, talk a little bit about food waste. When we started our digester facility, we, of course, uh, used the cattle manure as our base co-feed or substrate for that digester. Since then, we've added a number of uh, food processing waste streams from local processors, uh, chick hatch waste, turkey processing waste, uh, waste streams from ethanol plants, biodiesel plants, uh, pork processing plants. We basically take waste streams from all the major meat species in the area and then as well as waste streams from the ethanol and biodiesel industry. Food waste has really helped us go from running at 40 to 50 percent of uh, capacity to 100 percent of capacity. That's why food waste for us personally, but from a bigger perspective, utilizing that food waste to a higher and better use is really what we're all about. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about manure and how it varies from site to site. Uh, our manure, and this is a good one for after lunch, it looks like this as it comes off of our uh, cattle barns. It's a high solids material. We have to water it down so that we can uh, uh, utilize that in our, in our uh, digesters. We also, as I mentioned earlier, take other waste streams, soy oil waste, glycerin, animal processing waste. One thing we're trying to utilize now in our system is biomass. Uh, we are using cover crops as an energy source in our digesters and working extremely well. That's something that I think we're going to continue to evaluate, but I think it offers some tremendous potential for, for agricultural opportunities in the Midwest uh, going forward. Just to show a little bit about our energy production and how we're starting to really ramp up and, and uh, get to nearly 100% load. In 2016, we generated just under 60,000 MMBTUs of methane. In 2017, we were at 97,500, 65% increase in methane production, a little over 18% increase in electricity production. This is just a picture of our, one of our liquid defluent storage tanks uh, that the EQIP funding helped pay for. <clears throat> And then here's what we uh, are now starting to market to some of the local lawn and garden centers, but Moo Post, which is a separated solids material coming out of the digesters. Oh, I'm sorry. Current level of energy production uh, digestate that we're producing currently is around 20 million gallons uh, total, of which 16 million gallons uh, is in the liquid fraction, and about 25, 26 million pounds of biofibers are produced uh, annually now. We expect that to continue to go up. Uh, all of those, as Patrick mentioned, are really, uh, as far as I'm concerned, where the, uh, the silver lining is for our operation. Those are extremely valuable sources of nutrients, soil amendments for our soil. We're able to put back the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur to our soil, as well as the organic matter that not only comes from, from waste streams right on our own farm, but because we take in co-feeds from a variety of sources, we're able to trap that carbon and those other nutrients take those nutrients and apply those back to our farm and build and increase and improve our soil health. I think I went the wrong way. There we are. So to wrap up, uh, AgriRenew, along with Seavers Family Farms, has created what we believe is uh, an innovative way to capture all the beneficial aspects of renewable, renewable energy production. Uh, hopefully, I've talked a little bit about our facility, what we're doing uh, in terms of processing our, our waste streams, um, and why these types of on-farm systems will work, I think, not only uh, in Iowa, but in all areas of the United States, especially as we look to new uh, emerging biomass sources of energy. With that, I will conclude and turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that great egg story about how you're utilizing all these resources, all these wastes, but they're not wastes on your, on your family farm. We're going to actually shift to a story about something that's actually right in our backyard here in Washington, D.C. Um, Chris Piat is the Director of Resource Recovery for the District of Columbia Water and Sewer Authority, or D.C. Water. He directs the recovery of resources at the authority by establishing policies, plans, and procedures related to the recycling and extraction of value from recovered resources. Additionally, he will manage the biosolids reuse program, including contracts for re reuse and product development. Mr. Piat will also work to optimize the reuse of the authority's underutilized resources, including the biosolids product, with respect to water, energy, carbon, and nutrients. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come. Uh, I'm your neighbor, so anybody that wants to come and see a uh, advanced wastewater treatment plant, uh, give me a call anytime. We'd love to give you a tour. Uh, there's a lot to see. So I was excited to have the opportunity to come today because um, I work at this gigantic wastewater treatment plant. Not everybody really thinks about what happens when they flush and where everything goes. And what we do is we remove the pollutants, in air quotes, from the water and then return the clean water back to the environment. And in our case, those pollutants are uh, carbon and nutrients, largely. And of course, carbon and nutrients have value. So what I want to emphasize today is the asset that every city in America is sitting on top of, because we all have wastewater treatment plants. We all collect the sewage and we all treat it. Some municipalities choose to put it in the landfill. Some make use of it. There's all kinds of different things that we can do. So I would like to just 
emphasize that this is an asset and that we can do quite a bit with it. Uh, we don't even refer to ourselves as a wastewater treatment plant anymore, but rather as a resource recovery facility. Recovering, of course, water, the world's most precious commodity, but also nutrients, carbon, and energy. And oftentimes carbon and energy get lumped together because carbon is energy. We like to separate it because we are producing some, a large amount of energy, clean, green, renewable energy from our digesters. But the digest that digestate that comes out of the bottom gets returned to the earth from which it came and it's really important to return some of that carbon back to the land. Uh, we've always been very proud of our biosolids reuse program for 20 plus years. We've been re uh, recycling what EPA designates as class B biosolids and really the only place you can take it is out to a farm which is great because we're urban dwellers. We import carbon and nutrients from rural areas we take water from the river, we make use of it. What we don't use ends up down at the resource recovery facility. We return the clean water back to the river, cleaner than when we took it out of the river, to be honest. <laughs> uh, we make clean, green, renewable energy. It's tier one renewable energy. And then we're returning that carbon back again to the earth from which it came. Um, and you can see, I mean, we, we are proud of the fact that we are completing that carbon and nutrient cycle, but we'd really like to tighten that circle a little bit too, because it takes energy to take the solids out to rural farms, and if we can tighten that circle and make use of the asset in the service area, that's even better. So now we have digesters that we just built that we're extremely proud of. I'm very proud of our board for putting up this money. It was a discretionary project. We didn't have to do it. $470 million is usually a sum of money that's reserved for projects that are forced upon us by consent decree or something, and this is one that made incredible environmental and economic sense, um, and our board trusted the technical staff and we made a business case and we built it and it's been operating for about three years. Uh, it is the digesters here, we have four 3.8 million gallon uh, digesters. It's preceded by this process here, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit. It's thermal hydrolysis. It's a high heat, high pressure system that completely obliterates all of the pathogens and prepares the food so it's very available for the hungry archaea microbes in the digesters. Um, and uh, we then, the digesters produce the gas. The gas comes out of the top of the digesters. We clean it up. We have three five megawatt turbines. We're producing about eight to 10 megawatts of power right now. We use that power on site. We're the biggest user of electricity in DC as a single site uh, user. Um, almost every wastewater treatment plant in a city is because of all the power and the blowers and the pumps. We, our demand is 25 megawatts, so this, eight to 10 megawatts provides over a third of our needs, which again, huge cost savings. Uh, it's really great for our carbon footprint as well. Uh, but then maybe the coolest part is that the turbines, when they spin, they generate a lot of heat. You have to shed that heat or you're gonna melt your turbine. So we put heat recovery steam generators at the end of each of the turbines, capture that heat, convert it to steam, and that's what we use to heat up the Canby system, which is 160 degrees centigrade, that's very hot. Uh, and then we don't need any external energy to heat that up. It's incredibly energy efficient. It's really great. Uh, so this is just a block diagram of that exact same thing. Um, gas comes out of the digesters. We make electricity, pull the steam off, generate the heat to heat up the Canby system. What I haven't talked about is the digestate. So the digesters are not 100% efficient. They do not convert all of the organic matter to <coughs> methane, so whatever is left coming out of the bottom is a very stable, really nice uh, soil-like product. It comes out and we dewater it to about 30% solids and it goes out to farms. We send it to uh, landscapers, to soil blenders. We're actually selling some of it on the market. Um, very proud of that. So the digesters, whenever you build a digester, you want it to last for a very long time. So we overbuilt, um, we, are, we have the capacity to take 450 dry tons per day of solids through our digesters. That's what we think we're going to be producing in 30 years. So right now, we're only producing uh, or, or processing about 300 dry tons per day. So there's 50% more capacity there. That means we have the ability to import uh, outside wastes, such as food waste. We're working with the city, uh, the District of Columbia, Department of Public Works to on a feasibility study to determine whether or not it makes economic and technical sense for us to do it. We built this gigantic, huge uh, 
co-digestion model that looks at the operations, looks at the expenditures, the costs, looks at everything. You know, we bring in food waste, it has ammonia nitrogen in it, which then has to get dropped out and sent to the uh, head of the plant, and it takes energy and uh, costs money to, to recycle that. Um, program benefits are we reduce the cost, improves the product quality, generates a lot of clean, green, renewable energy, cuts the greenhouse gas emissions by 50,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions annually. It's about a third. Uh, and oh, by the way, saves us millions of dollars a year. So I really think it's the rare combination of a municipal project that makes great economic and environmental sense. So the solids end up on the farms. This is one of our farms in Fauquier County, Virginia. Uh, farmers love it. But we have um, forever taken it out there and given it away for free. We now have the Class A material, which we can use in an urban setting. We've been using it on community gardens. Uh, and this, this picture on the bottom is Casey Trees. It's a nonprofit in DC whose job it is to uh, reduce uh, or improve the tree canopy in the city. And that helps us too, because the more trees there are, the less water ends up on the street and then down at the sewage treatment plant. We have uh, sold some materials to some construction companies who are making a manufactured topsoil out of it as well. These guys did this all winter long because they couldn't find a good source of organic material. I went out there and took some photos a few weeks ago and uh, the guys had the audacity to complain about mowing. They were mowing too much because the grass was too thick. Uh, we've branded our product. It's Bloom. We're very proud of this branding effort. Uh, the infinity symbol, of course, connotes recycling, but the uh, Tagline, good soil is very obvious, better earth starts the conversation about carbon sequestration and green energy production. Uh, there is a national potential here. I just did some extrapolation based on what we're doing. And if the entire nation took their biosolids, the 7.1 million dry tons of biosolids that are produced annually and generated electricity like we do, not really feasible, but if everybody did, uh, it would generate 4.9 4 billion kilowatt hours per year. That's enough to power uh, about a half a million average American homes. The renewable energy credits are worth anywhere between 25 million and a billion dollars a year. And you could produce 16 billion pounds of steam for things like cooling towers and uh, building heat. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Our, Mantra is there is no such thing as waste, only wasted resources. So uh, I'm here to answer questions afterwards if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We're going to pause now. We have Congressman Scott Peters with us. Um, Congressman Peters serves California's 52nd Congressional District, which, inc which includes the cities of Coronado, Poway, and most of northern San Diego. First elected in 2012, he currently serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. He is also a member of the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, and the Biofuels Caucus, among many others. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Congressman Peters. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for accommodating my schedule. We just did, did our first round of votes, so I was a little bit late, so thank you. Um, thanks to the en Environment and Energy Study Institute and the American Biogas Council for hosting this briefing. Um, let me just say that the upside of not passing the farm bill is that we didn't pass the farm bill. <laughs> uh, for now, we're spared from a bill that would have eliminated the energy title and, and forced unreserved, un underserved communities to work harder for the reduced benefits. But there's still time to pass a good farm bill. Uh, that would create new economic opportunities for farmers, ranchers, small rural businesses, renewable biotech and energy efficiency companies in all 50 states. That's why I'm excited to uh, introduce the people here to, who have found different ways to uh, turn waste streams like food waste, manure, agricultural waste, and wastewater into profitable enterprises that employ thousands of people. Not to spoil the show, but you'll hear from a, well, you might have probably heard from this people already. <laughs> So a municipal water utility that nets 10 megawatts of electricity from wastewater treatment. Anybody there? Okay. <laughs> Company that uses methane emissions from a landfill to produce re clean, renewable, natural gas that powers its large fleet of refuse and recycling trucks. Close, Close enough. <laughs> a family-owned cattle farm that converts methane gas into manure from electricity. Excellent. They're all here. Attend we took attendance. 
Um, I'm excited about the future of bioenergy uh, carbon capture and sequestration technologies as a waste management solution that will not only open up new energy markets, but will put us on a path toward negative carbon emissions. So here's a couple of our legis my legislative priorities, which I will try to turn into as big an, uh, of an hour legislative priorities as possible. Uh, we need to create demand in the markets for biogas and for carbon. We've got to make sure that all products from a biogas system, including fiber, uh, nutrient products, and digestate are eligible for the biopreferred and biorefinery loan programs. We should also advance clean energy and carbon utilization technologies because we can't make our, meet our 2 degrees Celsius target um, by the end of this century without them. And we should open loan guarantees to carbon capture and carbon utilization equipment uh, at all biorefineries and coordinate policies, programs, and research to accelerate investment in advanced energy technologies. We need to level the playing field, uh, and that's your best argument typically around here, for all energy companies and technologies because we're going to need a diverse mix of energy generation from natural gas to nuclear to wind and solar and even algae to meet our energy needs. And she didn't mention that I am the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Algae Caucus. So that makes me a pond scum politician. <laughs> um, and I'm a little biased. I'm placing a long bet on uh, al algal biofuels. Uh, neither plant, animal, nor fungi. Um, algae is an amazing creature. And UCSD in my home district is making um, flip-flops and surfboards out of algae instead of petroleum. I actually have a, an algae surfboard hanging in my office in Longworth. There you go. Excellent. I can't really use biogas on the wall. but <laughs> um, I recently introduced the Bipartisan Algae Agriculture Act of 2018 alongside my colleagues, um, Representative LaHood, Kilmer, Biggs, Lujan Grisham. If you know anything about those people, that is from the Tea Party to the super left wing. So there's a, there's a wide variety of people supporting uh, algae. And as an aside, I'll say the one good thing about the House uh, bill was that it included an amendment from our bill, the House uh, Farm Bill, to establish algae R&D program at USDA. Um, so you're going to hear today, and you've heard today, uh, from uh, people who should all be an example to lawmakers that waste, which is something we have a lot of around here in DC, is three things. It's a revenue opportunity, a sustainable and affordable energy source, and a crucial part of our strategy to show to slow and maybe even reverse the uh, effects of climate change. Um, so I'm working on this as part of the Energy Subcommittee. So when I uh, signed up, when I came to Congress, it was to work on climate. Uh, this is my third term. Uh, it's hard to get on the Energy and Commerce Committee. I finally made it. Uh, I chose energy as my first choice. So I'm now the third-ranking Democrat on energy. Uh, it is something that I, I really want to work on. I'm really excited about what you're all doing. So I hope you'll consider us one of your entry points into this. Uh, if, we're, if we've missed anything. Um, let us know. We're working right now with uh, folks in the Senate to introduce legislation around these priorities. Uh, we hope to find that the political constituency, the constituency for these issues in general is as wide as we found in algae and is enough under the radar that we might actually get it passed, um, if, not this, if not this round, but certainly at the beginning of next term. Uh, with or without the Farm Bill, we hope we, we want to help um, ranchers, farmers, rural small businesses, renewables, biotech, and energy efficiency companies in all 50 states compete to solve our current energy and, and um, future energy needs. Uh, and we look forward to working with you all. We wish you very good luck, and um, stay cool out there. It's going to get warm. <laughs> and have a good, have a good uh, meeting. Take care. Thank you. Okay, so after that brief interlude to hear about some congressional priorities, I'm going to turn it over to Clark Pauley. Clark is the Vice President in CNR and CR and R Environmental Services Bioenergy Division, which encompasses organics recycling, anaerobic digestion, and composting. CR and R is a privately held integrated waste management company based in Orange County, California with 50 municipal contracts and over 3 million customers in five counties. Clark's primary focus at CR&R is on the marketing and sales of biomethane, carbon credits, and organic soil products from anaerobic di digestion. I'm going to hand it over to Clark.
Thanks, uh, ESI, ESI and ABC for having me today. It's an honor to be here. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what's going on in California around organics uh, recycling. Lots of exciting things going on. And thanks to Congressman Peters for all he's doing for our industry. Definitely helping uh, what we're doing. And he's also doing a lot for our environment. So thanks for all the support. We need all, all that we can get. Um, when I say I want to give you a little snapshot of uh, what we're doing in California, it's, I must say it's challenging to try to come up with a, about an eight-minute presentation about that covers the topic at hand and then also kind of gives you a flavor of what we're doing here in California. But it's a little bit like trying to drink from a fire hose, take a little sip of water. But uh, so forgive me for I'm going to read some, some of my slides here to keep me a little bit more focused because I tend to get a little bit excited and off, off track. So, um, But just a little bit about our company. You heard uh, privately held waste hauler based in Southern California. Uh, we have about 3 million residential customers, 30, 000, or 50,000 um, commercial con uh, contracts, about 50 municipal contracts, about 50, 1,500 employees, and we've been at it been uh, since the 1960s, and uh, basically we're just modern-day garbage men and women, and uh, maybe we'll call ourselves garbage people 2.0. Thank you. So when it comes to, let's see, do we go one too, Vinny? I think we're missing our first slide here. Okay. So when it comes to uh, looking at organics recycling in California, I think it's helpful to start looking at the regulatory framework and incentives that are really driving uh, the organics recycling in the state. And in the past several years, the California legislature has been really busy enacting legislation that encourages recycling and waste diversion in general, now particularly uh, organics recycling. Um, now, when I say organics in this context, like Pat Patrick uh, elucidated on, I'm talking specifically about yard waste, food waste, and, and wood waste. And those are the most common materials that are ideally suited for anaerobic digestion or in composting. Organics recycling is really the last frontier of recycling in our business, and it represents about 30% of what's going into landfills nationwide. Um, and at the end of 2016 in California, we passed an enormous piece of organics recycling legislation. And um, it's called uh, SB, S Senate Bill 1383, and it's just now in the process of being implemented. So you can see that we have a number of different bills here that have been sort of the, the foundation of the um, organics recycling from the material side. And then we have uh, this SB 1383 that has now just come to light as being the most significant piece of legislation that's going to really be driving organics recycling into the future. So just, just in terms of numbers, we're looking at uh, this piece of legislation is calling for, off of 2014 landfill numbers, a 50% reduction by 2020. In case anybody didn't check their calendar, that's only in two years. And then a 75% reduction in the level of uh, disposal by 2025, and that's only you know, six years away. So a really, really big number. Uh, this is what it looks like on, on a graph. Here, here we are today, you know, roughly in our disposal. We need to, by 2025, we need to get it find a home for about 12 million tons per year of uh, organics to get those out of the landfill. So how do we do that? On the, on the incentive side, the, the, the governor, with the help of a very supportive legislature, crafted some very workable financial incentives to keep, uh, help finance some of these greenhouse gas reduction recycling initiatives. The core of these incentives would be uh, SB and AB, uh, 32, SBAB 32, that really let set the foundation for the greenhouse gas reduction goals. And, and the core of that program is a carbon cap and trade program that uh, provides revenue and support for these programs. These cap and trade funds pay for seeding a lot of new carbon infrastructure projects that are having a positive impact on greenhouse gas reduction and creating jobs in the state. Now on the federal side, one of the biggest drivers for, the, for us that, that are producing renewable fuels continues to be the renewable fuel standard. We're all familiar with that, I think, in, in this room, I hope. Um, and in our case, we're producing a re renewable cellulosic fuel, and it helps off these uh, credits actually help offset the capital costs of project development, which helps projects get financed. So we have our big goals. We have some incentives and some financial drivers, and here's what we've done with them. So here's our, our solution, our California-sized California solution to help achieve some of these goals. We've now built two our first two phases of a four-phase project, a, a regional anaerobic digester, including a, a or dedicated organics receiving building, uh, two, two digesters, and um, also a control building and gas cleanup system. See some pictures of that later. Uh, just in terms of numbers, we're about 
At full capacity, we're at 320,000 tons per year in four equal phases. Our feedstocks are municipal source separated yard waste and food waste. Our location is in Paris. That's in Riverside County, California. That's the other Paris, the one without croissants and red wine. <laughs> and uh, and then startup uh, first phase was September 2016, and then we just are very pleased with the uh, getting our second phase up and running very quickly once the, con the construction was started or completed in just March last uh, this year. So in terms of uh, products, we're going to be producing at full build out about four million gasoline gallon equivalents of renewable fuel cellulosic fuel per year. And, uh, and we'll be generating a very nice quality, bagged quality compost of about 150,000 tons per year. So Patrick did a great job of giving you the really basics on uh, AD 101, but on the technology side, just, just uh, I'll just say in very basic terms, we built the, the world's largest cow stomach. On the, on the front, uh, front end, the cow eats uh, our separated yard waste, food waste. It goes through a continuously stirred process at thermophilic temperatures, meaning it has a little bit warmer than normal kills all the pathogens, goes uh, the solids drop out to make our solid fertilizer, and we have a, a liquid uh, product as well that can either be recirculated back to help the biology. Now, out, out the back end uh, comes the gas, just like a cow. We purify this gas into 99.5% pure methane in order to inject it into the SoCal gas pipeline, and we have a nice liquid soil amendment as well, and so we are able to capture all of the valuable products in the, the process of uh, anaerobically digesting them and putting them through our process. So just some fun facts about our projects. Um, we convert all of our organic yard waste into fertilizer, renewable, natural gas. Uh, pro program will keep organic waste out of the landfill. Our me methane is, a, is about 84 times more damaging in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, and burning renewable natural gas in our trucks actually destroys methane. And renewable natural gas has a much lower carbon intensity than fossil gas. And, uh, Powering trucks in our, uh, with our fuel is actually about 90% lower on the emission side than a, a traditional diesel vehicle. So here's some pictures of where we are today. We have our first two phases complete. And our control building, our gas cleanup systems complete. We had our basic gas cleanup system here. In order to get to meet the, the uh, SoCal gas pipeline spec, we had to build a, a separate system just to get that last 2% of purity complete. We have a nice control building, and every, basically every motor in the whole facility is controlled through this facility on the array of computer screens. And we had to build this uh, in order to keep the, what's going into the front end very clean. We uh, had to build this dedicated uh, Red receiving building. All the, the loads are, are tipped into this facility, cleaned up with a, a, a process of combination of mechanical and um, automated separation technologies. We have an in-house lab where we can uh, test all of, on a daily basis, all of the health of the digester, uh, the biogas content, and also evaluate new feedstocks coming in. And on the back end, as I mentioned, we're very serious about cleaning up the material coming in the front end. So coming out the back end, we have a very clean um, digestate. In this case, we turned into a uh, compost product that we can sell into a, our, the highest end market, which would be bagged fertilizer manufacturers. So you'll find this stuff, uh, some of our materials blended into uh, play, the stuff you'll find at Home Depot and other home centers. And so this is our biggest milestone here. We just reached uh, about a month ago. Uh, we finally did get into the, this is a SoCal gas point of receipt. This is located on our site. And uh, we finally got the, the approval to start wheeling our gas into the pipeline. And like I said, we have to get it to 99% pure purity in order to get there. But now once we have that in, in place, we can take that gas and wheel it to any of our facilities or anywhere in, uh, the, the gas grid is served. So in terms of our trucks, as we mentioned, we're running about half of our fleet now um, are on CNG, our CNG vehicles. This is a, tr a traditional com com uh, compressed natural gas vehicle. As Patrick said, it's an identical fuel. For, the, for renewable natural gas, so we're able to run our fleet, entire fleet on, on this fuel. Uh, the, basically, the way it works for us is our trucks pull up at night, they hook up, and then in the, in the morning, their, their tank is full, ready to go for the route. And uh, we're going to be, we're in the process of going to 100% renewable natural gas. We'll be there by 2020. We'll be purchasing the new Cummins Westport ISLG engines, and these are um, are classified by California as a near zero emissions technology. And uh, it basically beats the EPA existing NOx standard by about 90%. Uh, 
And uh, we're about halfway there, and like I said, we'll be 100% RNG fleet by, by 2020. So basically, now that we've hit our key milestones, we, we can continue to add future phases or develop projects with this basic model uh, to increase our organics recycling capacity and gas protection production. We're, we're grateful that we've been able to provide a solution that contributes to our state's organics recycling challenges. And it's really a solution that has so many different linked benefits. If you think about it, we're, we're, we're dealing with landfill diversion, greenhouse gas reduction, renewable fuel production, clean fleets, sustainable soils and agriculture, to name a few. So we're, we're happy to serve as a model for similar pro projects nationwide, and I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'm just going to hand it back over to Patrick Surface now. He's going to wrap things up for us and talk about some of the policy drivers. Thanks, Jesse. So I wanted to just this will be this will be also just as as quick as the earlier part part was here. Just to kind of since we are on Capitol Hill, I want you to be able to understand some of the main policy drivers um, that we have for the industry. But to kind of give you some context in terms of value, um, we we like the wind and solar industry. The renewable energy industry really needs to stick together. But we find ourselves comport, com, forced to compare ourselves with the solar and wind industry because. In our tax code currently, wind and solar, for example, have had this really long-term um, extension of a tax credit that gives them a lot of benefits for, for financing their systems and reducing the capital costs. Our credit, um, along with the credit for biomass and waste to energy and hydropower and some geothermal, has been expired basically for the last couple years. It was retroactively extended, and so now it's currently ex expired from the end of 2017, but they did that when it was already expired. So we haven't really been able to use it. And the one thing that they would want you to take away, we've already talked about the bottom part of this slide, which are all the other non-energy benefits. Organic material management, odor reduction, nutrient recycling, reduced or negative greenhouse gases, watershed protection, more jobs than a lot of other renewable energy technologies, because we not only have the construction, but then we've got the ongoing operation of these facilities as well and ongoing supply chain activity related to that ongoing operation. But on top of that, don't forget that our systems are producing energy 24-7. Um, one of the staffers asked us uh, earlier today, well, when you say you can um, supply enough energy for 7.5 million homes, what is that, 7.5 million homes a year? Well, no, it's 7.5 million homes now and for an hour and for a year and for as long as the biogas systems are running. They're running and they're producing energy. 24-7. Now we do have to, if you're making electricity, for example, you do have to change the oil in your engine every once in a while. So that's why um, Brian, for example, said that his one megawatt facility, instead of making 24 megawatt hours per day, he's making 23.5. We've got a 95% capacity factor. And so when you're looking at the cost of wind and solar, um, we like them. We need wind. We need solar. They're a resource. We are going to need a variety of resources. But don't forget to look at the actual cost that you're going to need about 5.6 times more solar because of the variability. You're going to need about 4.3 times more wind to get the same amount of actual energy output that a biogas system is providing. And so let's, when you look at the cost of systems, yes, the capital cost of some of the biogas systems is higher, but it's worth it. And then, of course, if you don't even care about supporting renewable energy. And there certainly are folks on Capitol Hill who don't really care about renewable energy that much. They don't want to have any handouts to the energy industry. Well, we've got something for you, too, because even if you don't care about renewable energy, what are we going to do with the 66.5 million tons of food waste that we generate each year? Now, we can reduce a lot of that by just better utilizing our food waste and better distributing it. And we should do that. And we should work with the new Food Waste Caucus chaired by Representatives Pingree and Young to reduce food waste. But food waste is still going to spoil, and that's going to have to be recycled. And unless we start finding ways to eat banana peels and pineapple tops and other things like that that aren't really very edible and aren't not, we don't plan for them to be, that's going to have to be recycled too. So we've got to have a management system to do that. We generate 31 billion gallons of wastewater every day. Unless our population is going to decrease or all of a sudden we stop flushing our toilets, we got to manage that material too. And what about all of our animals? So yeah, there's a significant vegan interest, I think, in this country, but I don't think everyone's going to go vegan. So we're going to have animals. We're going to have an animal 
population in this country, and we've got 8 billion cows, chicken, turkey, and pigs um, to manage. And let's take the dairy cow, for example. Did you know that a dairy cow produces 120 pounds of manure a day? So I don't weigh quite 120 pounds, that would be nicer, but you know, look at the 9 million dairy cows that we have in this country. That's the population of New Jersey. And every one of those 9 million dairy cows is putting out 120 pounds of manure every single day. And that's just the dairy cows. That's not even the beef cows like Brian's project or the rest of the agriculture animal industry. What are we doing then with that manure? We are, have so many resources in there that we need to better, better manage. And then for the agriculture industry, we've got lots of nitrogen needs. We've got lots of phosphorus um, needs in our fertilizers. Currently, we make nitrogen fertilizers from um, fossil natural gas. We mine phosphorus from uh, Florida and other places um, that creates radioactive waste in the process. It's not sustainable, and yet we have all these nutrients here already. We just have to recycle them. So again, 13,500 um, new biogas systems, $40 billion in capital deployment, um, lots of short-term construction jobs, lots of long-term um, jobs. We think it's really, um, it's really worth it um, for our country and for everything that we really want. Whether you care about energy or um, the environment or just creating jobs and economic activity, there's something for everyone. So just policy-wise, real quick, three main things that we would really like, Farm Bill, RFS, and uh, tax code subjects. So for the Farm Bill, we would like a separate energy title and we would like mandatory funding associated with that. Um, we made no secret last week on our feelings about that. We know that that's an uphill battle um, in the House. It's better in the Senate, but we're not there yet in either chamber. So energy title, separate, and mandatory funding associated with it. These programs help to get biogas industry systems growing. We're already growing, but this accelerates growth and the benefits that come along with it. On the RFS for Congress, um, yeah, the RFS isn't totally perfect, but it is the best policy that our industry has right now to accelerate growth. And in Congress, our message is don't mess with the RFS. It's working really well for our industry. It's helping to finance new projects, and we need it to continue. We would, however, love for some pressure to be applied to EPA staff to activate the renewable electricity pathway, um, which exists and is just not being utilized. And that's an EPA staff action that can happen. But letters and inquiries from your offices to ask them to activate that pathway may give them the nudge that, that we need them to, um, that they need to be able to actually act. Um, and then finally on tax, uh, we already, I already mentioned the lack of parity between basically wind and solar and fuel cells and some CHP and microturbines and some geothermal, all technologies that we love, but it creates a real problem when they have a 30% or 10% tax credit that we don't have. Not only does that make it harder for us to compete in the marketplace, but when a bank is looking to finance a project, they will actually capture a little bit of that tax credit in most projects, the way you finance them. The bank gets a little bit. So if, I, if you're a banker, do you want to do a project with a technology that has a certain tax credit and you can get a little extra margin on that project? Or do you want to go with a technology that doesn't have the tax credit and you can't get that margin? It has nothing to do with the technology. It just has to do with the certainty of the tax credit. So we need those tax credits to be extended. Representative Stefanik in New York introduced 4137. That does that for us. It extends um, that tax credit. And by the way, that, those tax credits for our industry only cover biogas to electricity projects. It wouldn't cover a project like Clark's, for example, that's going biogas to non-electricity. It's going biogas to vehicle fuel or heat. There's a companion, there's another bill um, that's been introduced in the House and the Senate, um, 2853, um, I believe and Senate Bill 988 um, in the Senate, that'll create the same tax credit that we're looking for with 4137, but it'll cover the non-electricity project. So it just covers the biogas industry. And these are, these are really low cost items for the biogas industry. We're not large yet, um, and this stuff, is, this stuff is really worth it. So if you wanna talk about any of those topics, um, and we'll be happy to talk with you about it, either in the Q&A or, or otherwise, that we can, go, we can deep dive into all those issues. We love talking about them. But we hope that you've had a chance to kind of absorb the, benefit, the full benefits of biogas. We hope you're interested in our industry and, and everything that we can do, because it does impact you um, even at an individual level with what you're doing at home 
flushing your toilet, managing your food waste, even if you don't own a farm, you're probably buying and eating those products. You know, this is a circular economy that we can create here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. So we just, as he said, absorbed a lot of information. There's a lot of different types of systems uh, we can look at. There's a lot of different policy drivers, but I would like to open it up to you, the audience, for questions that you might have. Are there any questions in the room? I have one in the front here, and I'm gonna ask that you wait for the microphone because I do know we have people watching online. So one right, right in the front here. Thank you, um, gentlemen, for for being willing to serve, first off. Um, I'm curious, Chris, um, your project was a, an enormous project and obviously very um, costly. Um, obviously, your your board was was a, a forward-looking board and decided to go forward with this, but I think some people are would probably look at that price tag and be a little surprised. Um, would you be willing to share um, how you went about um, uh, getting your financing, what that looked like, uh, that might give give some people some ideas. Sure. Let me say right off the bat, I'm not the CFO, <laughs> but uh, it was bond funded, and we had a we have a, a good bond rating. Um, and uh, when we did the business case, we looked at all the different potential savings, and 470 million dollars sounds like a lot, and it is. Savings was roughly $26 million a year. When you do the math, it comes out to a payback period of about 12 to 15 years, which is not bad for a municipal project, especially one where the bulk of the capital goes towards tanks that are gonna last 75 years, probably. But even that, if you're scratching down the numbers, the math doesn't work out. The do-nothing option didn't cost zero dollars. If we didn't build digesters, we would have had to rehab our lime stabilization system, which would have cost $175 million. So the payback is really 450 minus 100, or 470 minus 175, so that's 295 divided by like $26 million a year, which comes out, simple math, to be about 12, 12 years. That's the super simple version. <laughs> sure. And I have sort of a follow-up question for you, Brian, which is you also mentioned a cost, obviously, associated with your system. And, and in talking to farmers, I've heard that cost is a barrier. Can you talk about what are some of the barriers to seeing more on-farm digesters and if it's cost or other things? Certainly, uh, uh, the cost is an issue. Um, you know, we, we uh, uh, took on a, a, an inc incredibly large project for a family, for a husband and wife team, uh, but we're gonna come out of it. And so I, I guess, first of all, I can offer that confidence to anybody who's, who's looking at it. But secondly, uh, there's a number of pieces of advice I would give going forward. Uh, I would work cooperatively with other farmers. So if you have a, uh, a group of, uh, let's say, pork producers in the area, uh, work with some pork producers who want to build one of these centrally so you can utilize the, the hog manure streams uh, from several different operations. Uh, and then not only that, you can work with some of the area farmers if you're wanting to grow some of the green energy biomass crops that will help supplement the energy production for those facilities. So I would encourage working cooperatively. You know, the ethanol industry did it in Iowa just the same way. The first ethanol plant that was built in Blairstown, Iowa failed miserably. Uh, but since then, they've done a pretty good job of, of developing a model, very expensive plants, you know, probably put the price tag of your facility to shame on some of these facilities for ethanol plants, uh, but they are, they are now sustainable. They needed help to, to start and to operate in their early years just like we do, but since then they've, they've uh, become very sustainable and profitable and have built a model where uh, you, you're far better off using uh, additional private equity dollars to finance the construction of those rather than debt equity. So that would, that would be you know, one of those bits of advice that I would look for. So taking a smaller piece of the pie uh, pulling in some partners to help build a facility, I think, would be one way to, to help pay for the cost. Okay. <clears throat> Questions? I have one right here. Bill? Uh, for Brian, uh, did you mention that you are uh, uh, co-generating there? Are, and if so, what are you using the heat for? Uh, yeah, we do co-generate. We have a uh, Caterpillar 3516 Gen set and uh, generate the electricity and sell that to our local power company. And then the heat is used to heat our digester tanks. We operated a uh, mesophilic temperature range, so we have 
miles and miles of PEX line in our concrete uh, digester tanks. Those tanks are uh, 24 foot tall, 84, 85 foot in diameter, 970,000 gallons, also heat in the floor. And then we also have heat in some of our buildings uh, associated with our digester facility. So we utilize the heat, uh, but you know, what percentage of heat do we use that we generate? Uh, gosh, I don't know, I'm probably guessing around 30%. So we have tremendous heat resources available that we're not using right now. There's one in the back corner, all the way back. My name is Peter Ettinger. I'm with BTS Bioenergy. So we're totally in the tank and the biogas world. We've built 210 of them around the world and are just entering into the U.S. market and particularly in Maryland. I'm pretty, and love to talk about finance. It's a, kind of one of my favoritely weird subjects. Um, I'm really very interested in the challenges you have on land application of digestate because that seems to change on a state-by-state -state basis. And I'd be interested in all of your experiences and how to work that regulatory process through. So California is usually on the leading edge of uh, the legislative side of things. And we, we did recently, about two years ago, just redo all of our, um, through Cal Recycle Agency, our, it was called Title 14 in California. And that was the composting and included in-vessel di uh, digestion uh, so that kind of governed the new rules around composting and, and di digestate and the treatment of and the safe, uh, the, what they would consider to be the safety levels on that. So I would imagine that that's going to be probably be a model rolling out in the rest of the country. But that basically hits a lot of the 503 standards, and uh, they use th that, those standards for uh, metals and pathogens. Essentially, that those are almost identical. Um, but uh, in, in our particular case, we're, we're running at a thermophilic temperature, so we do get our pathogen kill done right at the very beginning. So if we do want to get our raw material out there, we're actually already kind of state of California approved to get that material straight out to the market without any, any restrictions. Uh, not everybody's in that boat, but that's what's going on in California. Yeah, this is Chris. Um, my advice would be start early and be patient. <laughs> We, uh, we have distribution and marketing permits now in D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and we are very close in New Jersey, and every state is different. Uh, different quirks, different, uh, different aspects that we had to go through. Um, we built relationships with the regulators, um, shared information with, from our inspectors just to build trust. And then we're maybe inordinately patient because it took a really, really long time. But I, you know, I didn't begrudge him because this was the first time that anybody had seen a thermally hydrolyzed biosolids in the U.S. and then nobody really wanted to be the first. Somebody had to. It ended up being uh, Maryland and then other people followed suit. So once, once we got one, it got a little bit easier. Just start early, be patient. Good advice. <laughs> start early, be patient. We work with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources on our uh, facility. Uh, our animal feedlot is, is regulated under uh, uh, the animal feedlot regulations in the state of Iowa. So there really is no specific chapter for an anaerobic digestion in the Iowa Code. Uh, so we're lumped in with animal feedlot regulations. In fact, I have to chuckle every year the DNR comes out and does a site audit for us and kind of tells us where there might be some deficiencies and, you know, how can we work to address those. Uh, you know, they, they call the biofibers pile manure, and I have to chuckle, and they, of course, have no defense, but I said, that's not manure, by the way. And uh, they understand. But there's nothing in the Iowa Code that's, that goes on to describe what it really is. So we're actually working now with the DNR on creating our own uh, new section in the Iowa Code for uh, the, the management of, of uh, liquid affluent as well as our biofibers or solids uh, material that we we generate. So we work with the DNR. Uh, actually, we have a pretty good working relationship with the DNR and hope we can continue to do so. And I'll just add, because this program wasn't available when you guys started um, generating digestate and needing to find these markets, but the American Biogas Council just last year created a digestate certification program. And the purpose of that is to help the customers buying digestate to know that the material that they're buying meets certain health and safety requirements. For example, it doesn't have viruses like pathogens in it. Um, you don't have heavy metals in it. And then it also gives you a third-party verified nutrient profile of the material. And so for anyone who's concerned about buying digestate or encouraging folks to use digestate, instead you can say, well, you should use certified digestate um, by the American Biogas Council, and all three of our, our speakers up here are participants in that program as producers of um, certified digestate. So we're hoping that that will help to really elevate 
the, um, the trust level for digestate because it's not a household name yet like compost and other soil amendments are. And once we can develop that level of trust, then the value will really increase. And who knows, you know, well, we already do have some projects that are producing more revenue from their digestate than there are from their energy. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. That will continue because mm -hmm. soil health drives our farms, doesn't it? There was a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, so this question is mainly for Brian and Clark as the two private enterprises in this. When you were considering doing a biogas system, how much of the consideration was offsetting your current costs, say your electricity or your heat, versus diversifying your revenue streams by being able to sell natural gas to the pipeline in your case, or also um, you know, electricity in your case? Uh, uh, really, the, the offset to costs of electricity was very minimal. We're, we're not a um, an, an energy hog, if you will, like a, let's say a, a large dairy uh, where you're running coolers to, to chill milk uh, and other or dairy products. Or wastewater treatment plant. What's that? Or wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, or wastewater treatment plant, exactly. So, so that wasn't a significant cost. It was really about, uh, you know, how can we maximize and, and enhance the value of those products we produce? What's the best uh, way to generate that rate of return from those resources that we are blessed with? And uh, at the time, uh, it looked like electricity was probably the way, best way to go. Uh, you know, fi fast forward now to 2018, we obviously have other options available uh, uh, to us. In our case, uh, being uh, from the waste management industry, it was really all driven as a material handling issue. So we really matched up our technology, in this case, a high solids digester built, um, built in, uh, by German technology, exactly to the feedstock we knew we needed to handle. So we have all these customers with all this material that we know we need to keep out of the landfill. So we started there, and then we found that there were all the other benefits that go alongside of it. Well, we can, we can take this material, turn it into fuel for our truck fleet, and then on and on. So we're able to figure out uh, ways to maximize the, the value of every single piece of that recycling stream, which is what we really, really do in the waste management business. We try to collect all the waste as, as uh, efficiently as possible and then find end, end markets for 100% of the material to the extent that we can. So it was a perfect match for us. Maybe just to follow up on that uh, as well, so just to demonstrate the math, we produce roughly 23.5 megawatts a day. We sell approximately 19.5 to 20 to our power company. So the other 3.5 uh, megawatts that we're utilizing are just for parasitic load to run our mixers, agitators, lights, pumps. There's a question right here. Hi, uh, David Biederman with Swana. Clark, I have a question for you. How much are uh, customers paying to dispose of the food waste at your facility, and how does that compare to other disposal options in Southern California? Yeah, so, so the way that we're working that with our, our contracts is that um, basically our, our municipal contracts, and we have about 50 of them, give or take, um, they all have an obligation to meet these new re recycling, organics recycling, and other material uh, challenges. Um, so what we do is we come to them and say, well, we have a solution built for you, and um, it'll cost you, let's say, anywhere between a couple dollars per household uh, per month in order to subscribe to the program, and that's uh, negotiated within our existing um, agreements, franchise agreements with the cities. And so they can say, hey, we'll take option A, or we could, we could say, or you could maybe look at another option, maybe building your own composting facility. Those are really the only two options that are readily available in the market. And then generally speaking, they, uh, our cities find uh, that they say, well, gosh, going through all those headaches and um, have everything else that we'll actually just go ahead and have a turnkey solution, pay, pay a little bit extra per month. So that's kind of how we've been handling it. Yeah. Any further questions? There's one right here, right next to the other gentleman. Hi. Uh, my question is for Chris and Brian. Uh, in these new facilities, how many additional jobs or economic activity, I mean, if you could put a dollar value, is generated for every dollar invested in this plant? And the larger issue is, you know, in terms of national security. The solar and wind industry has very cleverly played on this consumer emotional hook. You know, you can see panels and blades. But unfortunately, like biofuels, bioenergy, there's no visual, visually compelling uh, hook to, you know, get consumer acceptance. So how do you see kind of marketing the made in America 
aspect of these biogas systems. And so also additionally, how do you position this aspect of decentralizing the energy grid and making rural communities more resi resilient? So how, how do you pitch that to Congress people? Very good question. I'm not sure I can fully answer it. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab. Uh, <clears throat> we know that, uh, as Patrick alluded to, uh, livestock production is going to generate X number of tons per year of waste from 8 billion animals. We can, we can maximize the value of that by not considering necessarily a waste, but a resource. It's a resource to us, just like water and air and sun are resources. That resource is used to pr produce a couple of forms of renewable energy, like in our case, electricity and heat. And then that resource, we can add additional value to it by returning those resources back to our land and uh, not importing phosphorus and potassium from Canada or Florida, we produce our own fertilizer right on our own farms. So that's, that's a good selling tool in Iowa anyway, and I think probably in the Midwestern or at least agricultural areas of the country, uh, that you don't have to bring in inorganic forms of fertilizer from other parts of the world. We can produce our own fertilizer right here, and in the process, remove all the pathogens, and then, oh, by the way, we've got a little renewable energy we can sell you as well. Uh, so that's, that's one marketing aspect. The other thing we're looking at doing is, in Iowa, we really are taking a, a very conscious approach at water quality. How can we improve water quality? What, and, and the footprint that agriculture leaves on water, uh, and we can uh, tremendously reduce that footprint through other practices that maybe aren't prevalent right now, and integrating those practices with anaerobic digestion. And that's where we talk about utilization of biomass resources, cover crops, one of the aha moments here, just a few years ago, I'm, I'm going to be 59 this weekend, but it took me almost 57 years or 58 years to realize that when my great-grandparents settled in Iowa in the 1850s, uh, there, was, there were crops growing on that land, prairie grass primarily, 12 months out of the year. So it absorbed all of those nutrients that are in the soil 12 months out of the year. And so the nutrient loadings that went into our groundwater was very minimal. That's not true anymore. We've gone to a corn-soybean rotation, so those crops get harvested in October and November. So from November until the following April, there's nothing growing on that land. Now we've decided it's important for us to put something back on that land in the area form of cover crops, and that's really what we're trying to uh, grow. And, and the problem is there's a significant cost to farmers to do that. It's about 50 bucks an acre to plant the cover crop and to terminate it the next spring so you can plant your following corn or soybean crops. Rather than killing it with Roundup or some other herbicide, why not chop it, stockpile it, and feed it to your digester? That's where we think we can also market and position anaerobic digestion in, in Midwestern or agricultural areas of the country. I'd just like to add something from an urban perspective, too. We are, you saw our Bloom logo there. I mean, it's, we're not shying away from the fact that this is a DC water product, and this comes from the citizens. Uh, the Good Soil, Better Earth tagline sort of steers the conversation towards green energy. And uh, the, the populace in DC, I mean, it's a very active, environmentally conscious group of young people. <laughs> so they're, they're very interested in this message. I've been very pleased and surprised at, at what traction it's been getting. I can't believe I didn't have it on one of my slides, but we have this other graphic that we have. It's a toilet with a little electrical receptacle that goes into the side. <laughs> Was it there? All right. All right. And the, the tagline for that is, you know, power from the people. <laughs> because it, it, and it, it reminds them that every time they make a contribution to our system, they help us make green energy. So we're really tying it back and, and a, as a locally sourced efficient energy because if we use it, you know, there's not gigantic transmission losses if we use it all in D.C. And so we're trying to tie it to local production as well. You know, if you really the point you made in your presentation about returning water that's cleaner than what you're pulling out of the river, I think is a is a win win. It's a huge marketing uh, opportunity. And I'll just add, I think that's a really good question. How do we make biogas relevant to people? Power to the people is an awesome way to do it. I love that. Food waste is another way to do that. Um, I think that we need to get people to care more about recycling food waste. We recycle glass, metal, paper, and plastics a lot of places around the country, not everywhere, unfortunately, but a lot of 
people care about recycling glass, metal, paper, and plastics. We look for those blue bins around here. But is anyone looking with their leftover food waste when you go down to the cafeteria here where you can put that? It's really bad here in these buildings because it actually says the food waste is specifically is not supposed to get recycled, which is wrong. It's appropriate for this building because you don't have a place to put it. Um, but we need, we, you should be recycling food waste. If we get people to care about recycling food waste, then we're going to get people asking, how do I do that? And there's only two options, biogas systems and composting systems. And they're going to work hand in hand. Composting systems work really well, low capital costs, low volumes. Biogas systems work really well with high volumes. And you're going to have a mix of them in between. So every city, every place you go, you're going to have, you're going to have a mix of them if we're recycling our food. If we can get people to care about food waste, I think we're going to be getting a lot further, uh, further along. Food Waste Caucus that was just announced two weeks ago for any of you staffers here. If your boss isn't a member of the Food Waste Caucus, it's bipartisan. Um, you should get them to sign up. We get people to care about that. I think they'll ask the right questions to get around to um, biogas. Great question. There's another question in front here. Thanks. So we've been spending the last two days going around talking to people. Uh, well, Chris, you've been spared this, but uh, the ABC has been going around. And mostly we've been trying to reach out across the aisle to talk to people who are not uh, you know, naturally always drawn to renewable energy issues or to sustainability issues and try to find common ground with them. But the other challenge that I find working in the, especially in the animal waste to energy sector and working in commercial scale agriculture is that there are people who are in the progressive community who are critical sometimes of biogas as a solution, and especially with the way that we work cooperatively with commercial scale agriculture, the way we address the, uh, you know, the demands that are getting placed on the environment by commercial scale agriculture. And you made a quick nod to it uh, in one of the slides, Patrick, where you said, look, not everyone is going to become a vegan you know, to address our you know, food supply issues that are looming in the future. I can assure you that aside from the people who are already vegans, no one is going to do that, right? So <laughs> the question is, you know, is there any evidence, and I'm hoping the answer here is no, is there any evidence that increased biogas projects are going to somehow lead to an explosion of additional commercial scale agriculture, or that it is somehow going to relieve us of our sense of responsibility to continue to make our food supply system and our waste management systems more and more sustainable. And I know part of that is, to, can you speak to how the ABC also works on those issues as well? Uh, I can assure you the answer is no. What, uh, what Lisa and I looked at and our family when we built our facility is we, we knew that we were going to have to achieve some economies of scale. I mean, we used to have a three to 400 head beef cattle feedlot in an open lot where the manure ran downhill and eventually made its way into a creek, river, or stream. That's the way uh, beef cattle production uh, developed in the United States. And, is, and, is, and so what we believed was that that's wrong. We want to contain that manure. And, and utilize that resource in our facility. So that led us to the uh, uh, concept of anaerobic digestion. I toured some facilities in Nebraska that had already implemented that. We went to Germany and saw it in, in action, uh, and it only gave us uh, reinforcement that you can take an existing facility, and that's really what we had because we built two new cattle barns in 2011 and 2012 and then built our digester and then cap capture the beneficial aspects of, of livestock production with that anaerobic digester. There's a number of uh, livestock operations in the United States that can then can capitalize on AD systems. We're starting to see that now with uh, some major uh, uh, pork processing companies in the United States who are looking to biogas production in Missouri, North Carolina. They're going to be looking at it very seriously, obviously. Uh, and I think Iowa is going to be right behind that uh, with some of those larger pork processing facilities and integrators to go to their producers and say, I think we need to do something different with the, the way we handle and manage our livestock waste. And I think that's where we'll, we'll improve upon. You know, we didn't grow up as farmers saying, gosh, I'd like to raise more cattle than anybody else. It's once you achieve a level that you feel comfortable managing, now what can we do to better this system? And that's where AD comes in and, and helps us achieve that goal. I'm glad you asked the question about, about large, large farms and are we going to encourage more of them to be created. I'm, I'm glad to hear Brian say what, what I also believe, which is no, we're not going to be encouraging a lot, of, of, a lot of larger farms by having biogas systems. And part of the 
reason that they that there are biogas systems on large farms right now is they've had the biggest problems to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so they have to do something, and a biogas system makes a lot of sense. So you put biogas systems first in the place, places where they have the biggest problems, solve those problems, and then the other folks will, will catch on. One of the key things that I think biogas systems will help to encourage family farms and the, and the smaller farms is that it creates an additional revenue stream. And not only is that additional revenue stream important because it's additional revenue, but as commodity prices go up and down, now you've got something else that's maybe helping your operation to be much more stable. And as we can, and it helps to create your efficiency of your entire closed loop, the cycle of carbon that Chris described and the cycle of making sure that those nutrients get recycled and put back onto your fields and, and all that. that's material that you have to manage. And these biogas systems can help the small and medium farms, sized farms um, also to become much more efficient. You just have to apply the technology a little bit differently. We've got companies that specialize in small and medium sized farms. We've got companies that specialize in large farms and thankfully there's a place for both. Great question. Are there any further questions? We have a few more minutes. One over here. Uh, Dave Weyburn, Genesis Industrial Group. I'm going to ask a leading question. <laughs> so um, isn't it true then if, if the goal is that we want to enable small and you know, medium-sized farms to, to thrive that the energy title project, uh, programs of um, the Farm Bill are necessary because they enable through small grants to leverage additional uh, capital out there that can, can, can make it possible for smaller families, uh, smaller farms to be able to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to build the facilities that help uh, improve environmental, uh, um, you know, uh, stewardship. Absolutely. Uh, those energy title uh, uh, programs are essential to, to the uh, enhancement of any livestock uh, AD system that you might want to consider. Um, you know, we, we uh, received uh, the beneficial aspects of those grant programs, uh, BCAP, EQIP, REAP, are all beneficial to our operation or have been beneficial. Uh, we want to make sure those resources are available to other uh, projects that come along in Iowa or other parts of the United States to, uh, to grow the industry. Well, I think that's a great uh, point to wrap up on, that these programs in the Farm Bill are really critical in the energy title. Um, it's very salient on, on the Hill today. And I just want to thank our speakers here. I hope you really learned something about kind of how we can really utilize these wastes as a resource, how we can, um, as Patrick said, kind of start beginning to create a circular economy, because these wastes are going to be here whether or not we uh, decide to utilize them. So please join me in thanking our speakers for a great panel.